welcome to the Emotional Balance Sheet Podcast, your guide to help you manage life, money, and multiples. Each episode, host Paul Fenner, Tama Capital's president and founder, and the proud parent of four amazing children, including one set of triplets, will provide insights on successfully sustaining an active lifestyle, career, and family through comprehensive wealth management strategies, financial education, and lifestyle planning, specific to parents raising twins, triplets, and more. Learn more, subscribe to the show, or connect with Paul at TamaCapital.com. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for investment decisions. Clients of Tama may retain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. My guest this week is Shana Levin, a mom of twins, a licensed property and casual insurance agent, and the owner of Levin Insurance Agency with her husband, Jeff. Levin Insurance Agency is an independent insurance agency, which means Shana's team represents many different companies that allow them to choose the best carrier for their clients' insurance needs. In our conversation, we talk about all facets of the property and casualty insurance landscape, especially in Michigan, where auto reform is a hot topic. Shana explains what the new auto reform law means from both a cost and coverage perspective. From an insurance cost perspective, we talked about how there's greater emphasis on tickets and accidents and frequency and severity on your insurance rates for both home and auto than any other factors. Specifically for families with young drivers just starting out, Shana identifies three ways to reduce your auto insurance cost. Shana also addresses the value that an umbrella insurance can have as part of your comprehensive wealth management plan. She refers to umbrella insurance as an asset insurance policy, which is a very low cost option to extend your liability protection. Finally, Shana talks about the challenges of operating her business remotely during the early days of COVID-19 while homeschooling their twin children, and how life and business have changed since the economy has begun to open back up. Please enjoy this conversation with Shana Levin. I'm excited to have you on the show today. It's going to be really interesting because Shana has, I think, a unique take on this whole COVID situation because she is the mom of twins. She's also a small business owner with her husband. And in the state of Michigan, where we're both located at, we have a plethora of insurance changes coming down the pipe. I guess they've kind of been already implemented, Shana, I guess, to a certain degree with our auto insurance. And so I think that's a good place to start is talking about your background in the auto insurance or homeowners insurance industry. Talk a little bit about what you do, and then we can dive a little bit deeper into these changes that are affecting everybody and just the plethora of questions I get from people. I'm like, what does this mean? Are my rates going up or down? Because I've lived all across the country, well, I guess seven or eight different states. And ironically, I've lived in two states, Michigan and Kentucky, where they have this no-fault law. So I'll be really interested to get into the detail behind that and try to explain that for our listeners because I'm sure you do this every day and it's still complicated, I think, for, for most of the general public. So I'll let you take it from here. All right. Well, thanks, Paul. I really appreciate you having me on the show today. So I have been in the insurance business for just over six years prior to getting into insurance. I sold mortgages for 10 years. So when I left the mortgage business, insurance kind of seemed like a good transition. I went from working for someone else to working for myself. We've started now two different insurance agencies, the current agency in Commerce Township we've had for a little over three years. So we do personal insurance. So auto insurance, home insurance, and then the toys that go along with them. And I do work with my husband, Jeff. I work in the office working with customers and our staff. And Jeff works behind the scenes with our marketing and financial stuff right up Paul's alley. So there has been a lot going on with auto insurance reform, and it has been a crazy few months. Auto insurance reform by itself was insane. It started being talked about in May of 2019. The governor signed a bill saying this needed to get done. The bill was going into effect July 2nd, 2020. Well, in between that, March 2019 happened, and now we're in the middle of a pandemic, so we had to shut down our office, everybody went to working from home, but all of our insurance carriers were right on the cusp 
of rolling out their changes for auto insurance reform. How are their computer systems going to work? How does the law work? So we had to go from having all these scheduled in-person meetings to doing everything virtually. I had to teach my team about all of these different changes virtually and still had to run our business. We still had customers who needed new insurance outside of auto insurance reform. They bought a new car, they bought a new house, just whatever. So it was very crazy for a couple months there at home. The first few weeks of July were crazy. I was working 15 hours a day, seven days a week. It was rough, but thankfully it has slowed down a bit. And the changes from what we found are not as drastic for most people as the media and the politicians would make you believe. A lot of people read the headline, your insurance will be cut 45%. But what the media didn't even understand, let alone talk about the right way, was that there's only one piece of insurance that was going down. If you've ever looked at your declarations page, which is the, the piece of your insurance policy that breaks down all the coverages, each coverage has its own price. And the price of just one of those was supposed to be going down, but it only goes down 45% if you get rid of a coverage. So it's much more complicated than what the sensational headlines would make you believe. And now I actually just yesterday or the day before searched for auto insurance reform Michigan on Google to see if there was any new news articles. And there hasn't even been a news article in the last three or four weeks about it. Obviously, politics has taken over, but it was this big thing leading up to July 1st. And then it's just gone quiet now, which is good because it helps us catch up a little bit. I noticed that myself where there was a lot of headlines about this earlier in the year. And obviously, COVID took over. If I understand it right, one of the reasons that makes auto insurance so expensive in Michigan is this unlimited liability. Like if you get hurt in an accident, your medical coverage is paid for in perpetuity. Is that the right way to think about it? Yeah, you used the wrong word though. You used the word liability. So there's two main pieces with auto reform that people get confused but are both pieces that are changing with reform. So there's liability, which is the amount of money that you're on the hook for if somebody sues you if you're in an accident, and then the amount of money the insurance company, the amount of coverage you have for that insurance company to defend you. And then there's the medical coverage. And up until July 2nd, and still on your policy if you haven't made any changes, in Michigan we've had unlimited medical coverage. No dollar cap, no time cap. We're the only state in the country that has this. It's expensive not only because there's no cap, but because there's been doctors, hospitals, contracts that have taken advantage of this unlimited offer. So it's like if you've ever gone to the chiropractor, the very first question they ask you is, is this from an auto accident? And then you say no, and they're like, are you sure? They hope it's from an auto accident because they can have you go forever and get paid. And they can charge more because it's from an auto accident. There's no fee schedule. There's no limits. There's no caps. So there's been, frankly, a lot of fraud. And what then happens is the insurance is expensive. People don't carry insurance. Then you get in an accident with somebody who doesn't have insurance. And now your insurance costs more because of the no fault. So it's this like constant problem. And the reform is nice. It gives people options, but it's not bringing that fraud under control yet. Fee schedules don't go into effect for another year. So for the next year, people can still charge whatever they want. I think the idea is nice and maybe in time we'll start to see it actually make a bigger difference. It's nice that it makes some difference, but it's not the sweeping change that was advertised. Okay. So the no fault doesn't have anything to do with this unlimited medical piece, right? No, the no fault is the physical damage part of your policy meaning if you're in an accident, it's the part that fixes your car. So no fault just means if you are in an accident, your insurance fixes your car, their insurance fixes their car. Now the police report will still list who is at fault or who's more at fault because then that determines whether or not you pay your deductible if you have broad form collision. If you have broad form, then you don't pay your deductible if you're not at fault. But then with auto reform, fault also determines how much mini tort coverage is paid, which is, a whole different ball game, but <laughs> whenever you say tort, my <laughs> eyes just go like crazy. I'm like, I remember that from a law class I had. Exactly. I'm like, I'm like oh my God, my head will explode. Yeah, but the no fault doesn't have anything to do with the medical, but I'll give you my three minute monologue if you don't mind the conversation I have with every single person that we talk to about this. No, go right ahead. 
there's two pieces changing with auto insurance reform. A couple little pieces, but two main pieces. The first is liability. So that thing I mentioned where if you're in an accident and you injure or kill somebody, they sue you. It's the amount of money that your auto insurance company will pay to defend you. A lot of people carry 100000 per person, 300000 per accident, or 250000 per person, 500000 per accident. The state had a minimum level of 20000 per person, 40000 per accident. Now the state has a new default limit, which is different than a minimum, a default limit of 250000 per person, 500000 per accident. So that's a high limit. And the reason they made this default limit is, number one, if somebody doesn't choose a limit, they're getting a good high limit but people are gonna start suing each other more because of the second piece, which is the medical. So you've always had unlimited medical on your auto insurance. Going forward, you can choose to keep that unlimited medical or you can decrease it to 500,000 per person or 250,000 per person. Or if you have Medicaid, you can drop it to 50,000 per person or Medicare, you can completely opt out. The idea is choosing lower medical would save you money, of course, there's risk and reward, but just like you can choose lower medical, so can every other driver out there. So now if you're driving around and you get in an accident with somebody who's chosen a lower medical limit for themselves and their medical bills exceed the coverage they chose, now it's your fault. Where before there was no real gap in the medical coverage, you could still sue somebody if there was death or serious disfigurement, but now it's any economic change. So if you can't afford your bills because you chose to opt out, the person who hit you now better hope that they had really high liability coverage because now you're getting sued for something you couldn't get sued for before or there wasn't much opportunity. So in that example, if I got hurt in an accident and I had $100,000 of the medical coverage, but my bills ended up being $150,000, so I'm $50,000 over my medical limit, then basically you're telling me I could go back and if I'm not the one at fault, if somebody else was the one at fault, I could go back and sue that other person for the $50,000 difference? Yes. Now, hopefully you're not decreasing your medical without having some other medical insurance, like through work or a private health plan or Medicare, or Medicaid, whatever. But yes. And even the fault doesn't even matter. Like You can sue for anything. The problem we have right now is there's no precedent. We don't know how this is all going to play out in the courts. We just know, in theory, what could happen. A lot of times in insurance, we talk about things based on previous experience. I don't think this will get paid out because I've seen it before and it didn't get paid out. Reform is new since the 70s, before I was born. So we don't have that precedent to draw from as insurance agents to confidently say, it'll be okay, I've seen Blue Cross pay out or I've seen Medicaid pay out. Like, we have no idea, but we, as insurance agents, are very risk adverse, so we just err on the side of caution and say, that could happen. Because that was one of my other questions too, because I know that Teresa and I will get a letter, it seems like annually, like Blue Cross Blue Shield, who's our medical insurance provider, that we need to sign a piece of paper or something that we've got, I don't know what you call it, like cross coverage for medical between our auto insurance and our medical insurance. Yeah, they call that coordination of benefits. How does that work? What does that mean? So coordination of benefits used to be a bigger deal than it is now. But what coordination means is who's going to pay first in an auto accident. Is the auto insurance going to pay first? And if they are and the auto insurance is unlimited, then your health insurance really wouldn't come into play. Or is the health insurance going to pay first and then go back to the auto insurance kind of as the backup plan? You had the choice to write the insurance health primary or auto primary if your health could be primary. A lot of health insurance wasn't primary, so that never came up. And it used to not make a huge difference in the premium. Some carriers didn't even offer the option to be auto or health primary because it just didn't make a difference. It wasn't worth you calling your insurance, waiting on hold for two hours to get a letter to save $5 a month. Now it's less of a concern about who pays Actually, it could be more of a concern. I don't know. We haven't really had it play out, but who pays first, who pays second could come into play with those limits, but we just haven't seen it play out to know. But that's what you're talking about, coordination of benefits. And that used to be the only way to decrease the cost of your medical coverage on your auto insurance was if your health insurance paid first, then your auto price could be a little lower. Now, there is a much bigger way to make your price lower, and that's choosing that limit for the medical. So going back to my example of that 
the limit that I chose was 100,000, incurred 150,000 of medical expenses. Is that where this coordination of benefit comes in as well? Like my auto insurance would cover, I guess it goes back to your point, like, well, deciding who pays first. Yeah, I don't know. (laughs) The answer is I really don't know because we haven't had a claim yet, right? It's only been a month. We haven't had a claim yet that has had medical that has exceeded any sort of a limit to know who pays first, who pays second, whose limit gets exhausted first. And frankly, I'm not an attorney. I don't know all the legalese of how the the contract works, but that limit's going to get exhausted, whether it's a limit with your health insurance or a limit with your auto insurance, if there is a limit. The benefit to the unlimited is there was no limit. So nobody really had to think about it. Do you know, when I was doing some research on the reform itself, I don't remember what I found, but why is it that the state of Michigan is the only state in the union that has this unlimited medical? I couldn't tell you why it happened, like I said, before I was born, but I think in Michigan, there's a lot of lobbying and auto industry, and it just goes back literally generations to like, if we stopped doing this, somebody's pocket would not be lined anymore. And I really think it comes down to that. I'm not exactly sure the details. You're probably right. You make a good point there. So again, this reform is new. So with your clients, are you seeing people continue with the unlimited or are you seeing people go down to a certain level or what are you seeing at your insurance company? We're seeing both ends of the spectrum. People who are able to save money and still stay unlimited because reform brought prices down for many people without having to change anything. They're keeping the unlimited, but I've also told people I'm keeping unlimited on my own, at least for this first year, because I don't know how it's going to play out. Yes, I've got health insurance, but I don't want to be the guinea pig to figure out who's going to pay, when they're going to pay. Let somebody else file a claim. Let's let them figure it out. Let's let there be some statistics before I'm comfortable decreasing my own coverage. But then there's the other end of the spectrum. I mentioned risk versus reward earlier. The risk is if you choose to decrease or opt out of your coverage, your medical coverage, there are things that even the best health insurance will not pay for that auto insurance does pay for. Those are things on the catastrophic level. Like if you become wheelchair bound, auto insurance will pay to give you a handicapped accessible vehicle or make handicap modifications to your car, provide you with a professional attendant, like if you need nursing care. Your medical insurance might not do those things or probably won't do those things. So there's the chance that if you don't have this coverage, you don't have the coverage from anywhere. But that's a chance. That's like a 1% chance. There's a 100% chance you have to pay a payment every month. So for our excuse me, customers who are seniors who have Medicare, they need the money. They don't care if something happens to them on the off chance something happens. They need to be able to afford their bills right now. So a lot of them are choosing to opt out and rely on Medicare. Now, in every other state, the health insurance companies pay, Medicare pays, Medicaid pays, but I don't know how it shakes out. I'm not in those other states. So we're seeing a lot of both ends of the spectrum. We're not seeing a lot of people do the middle coverages, which is 500,000 or 250,000. Number one, 250,000 is not much lower than 500, so you might as well get double the coverage for literally a couple dollars more. And then with 500,000, it's not that big of a difference from unlimited. So we're seeing people do either end of the spectrum. Now, if you don't do unlimited, you don't pay that MCCA fee. It used to be $220 per car per year, now it's $100 per car per year. Oh, that's what that was? Because I I always wondered what that 220 was because in kind of prep for our conversation, I was looking at mine and I always saw that 220. I'm like, if you have a lot of cars, (laughs) well, you've got a set of twins. I've got the triplets plus one. That could be a lot of cars. By the way, I want to circle back to one of the questions that a few of my families asked me about because they knew you were going to be on the show today was... Talk to her about how I can decrease my car insurance, (laughs) my new teenage driver. So we definitely need to circle back to that. But I want to stay, I think you hit on this point where I wanted to go as well, kind of next steps where talking about the cost. So there's two questions here for you. One is you mentioned that just with auto reform in general, you guys have seen costs come down. Was that correct? Did I hear you say that right? 
I did say that, but that's not for everybody. One of the things that they never really mentioned in the media or the politicians about reform is they took away a lot of discounts. You used to get discounts for being in a good zip code or high education level, owning a home. You don't get discounts for that stuff anymore. So depending on how much those discounts were helping you, once those get taken away, for some people, we're actually seeing prices go up with reform. That is totally unexpected, and that's a fun conversation to have with people, but it's just the part of it that they tried to put everybody on a level playing field, but when you do that, there were people that were up here that are going to come down, but there were also people up here that are going to come up. Same thing with tax reform. When we had tax reform, there were winners and losers, and try explaining that to somebody that actually lost out because the SALT tax, which is state and local income tax. So here in the state of Michigan, we have what four and a quarter state income tax, And so a lot of people hit that $10,000 cap. They lost the benefits of those deductions. Yeah. So without getting too complicated, your family is a great example. If you have unlimited medical and the cost of the medical on a claim exceeds $575,000, then the insurance company is reimbursed by the Michigan Catastrophic Claims Association, MCCA, which is that $220 or $100 fee. If somebody chooses 500,000 as their medical limit, it's 500,000 per person. So now you're not paying into MCCA, which means MCCA is not paying out to you if something happens. Let's say your entire family is, God forbid, in the car and everybody's injured. Now it's 500,000 times six. So there's $3 million of exposure for the insurance company without that $575,000 cap and then the state fund pays. So that's how some people's prices are going up, just based on the number of people they have in their home. And the cost of that 500000 per person is now a higher exposure for the insurance company than Unlimited was. So that's super fun. That makes sense with auto reform and some people's costs coming down and some people's costs going up. So I think you touched on this a minute ago, but how much of a cost differential or savings really is this unlimited piece. If you go from unlimited to unlimited, like that's what I did, Jeff and I did on our policy, I think the savings was like 8%. So you're still saving even if you stay unlimited, that your costs don't Some people are, yes. Okay. Yeah. Now this doesn't affect your insurance, auto insurance, until your renewal. So let's say you don't renew till February. Don't expect your price to go down unless you do something before February. And insurance carriers either are allowing what's called an endorsement or like a a midterm policy change, just like if you got a new car to go into reform, you might have to rewrite your entire policy, which could have its own pros and cons. Or let's say you got a ticket in the middle of your term and it wasn't on your insurance yet. Now it's going to be on your insurance, but everybody should talk to their insurance agent and say, okay, could I do something now that makes sense? And if I can, cool, let's do it. If not, then you check it out at renewal. So it doesn't affect you until you do something or your policy renews. Okay. So two questions along those lines. Is it better, and maybe it's different by insurance company, but is it better to look at getting a full year policy rather than a six month? Because you can, I guess, lock in that price, which I guess it could go higher, it could go lower. What do you guys typically do with that? We generally offer everybody a 12 month policy, like you said, to kind of lock in that price for a year. If you do a six month, then there's the opportunity for that price to change every six months instead of every year. To me, that seems more risky. Yeah, there's certainly more risk, although insurance rates don't change like mortgage rates daily. They don't change that frequently. And I know there's stuff built into reform where carriers can't change rates for like eight years or something. I don't know all the details, but it's not that fluid. What could change is your rating factors, right? You could have a birthday in six months and now you're paying something higher because you had a birthday instead of getting that lower price for the year until your next birthday or a ticket or an accident. The only real benefit to a six month policy is if you're gonna pay in full and you can't afford to pay in full for 12 months, you can pay in full for six months. There is a small premium to have a 12 month policy. We see prices are a little higher on a 12 month policy versus a six month policy, but you're paying for that security. It's not a huge difference, but there is a small premium for that longer term policy. Okay, this is another probably question I got a lot too is how big a deal is getting a ticket or being an accident? How big an impact does that have on the cost of insurance? It's big and it's getting bigger. 
we saw something interesting happening. Time is lost on me anymore. I want to say last year, but it could have been earlier this year, where people who did not have a ticket or an accident in their most recent policy term, but had a ticket or accident in the previous policy term, or even two before that, their prices were going up. And what we dug in and figured out was carriers are putting much more weight on previous claim and ticket activity than they used to. So what they're saying is if you got a ticket or claim in 2018, your price might not have gone up in 2019, but in 2019, they did some statistical research and figured out, wait a minute, even if you didn't have a ticket this time, the fact you did before makes you much more likely to cause a claim next time, so we're gonna raise your price. So it is big, and there's two words that people should keep in mind, and that's frequency and severity. How often are these things happening and how much is being paid out when it happens? If you are somebody who does a lot of highway driving and you're always getting windshield chips, consider paying cash for those because it might not be a huge dollar amount claim, but you are hitting that frequency button a lot. And carriers do not like that. If you have towing on your auto insurance policy and your car's breaking down a lot, that shows up as a claim. Don't use your auto insurance roadside assistance. Get a AAA policy or some other policy for that roadside so that your insurance rates aren't going up because of things that you see is very minor. Even if you get into a not at fault accident, it's not your fault, but your rate is going to go up because your insurance paid out. And people have a hard time digesting that. It wasn't my fault. I didn't pay my deductible. Why am I paying more? Because your insurance company needs to make their money back. It's the unfortunate reality. Even right now, people say, I'm not driving. My insurance rate should go down. You wouldn't believe some of the claims we're seeing. It's like people forgot to drive. So you might not be driving, but we are seeing some bonehead claims right now. People hitting each other in their driveways or not remembering how long their car is and turning in a parking lot and hitting somebody like it's bad. And home claims, people are home more. So they're doing dumb things at home more. So <laughs> that stuff is not good. So I couldn't tell you a percentage because it's different with everybody, depending on their previous history, their carrier, the benefits they have on their own policy for accident forgiveness or whatever. But don't do those things. And then before I forget, you asked me about teen drivers. Oh, yes. How to keep those prices down. Don't let your kids drive till they're like 27 <laughs> is my best 27? advice. Yeah, probably a good idea. Maybe 25. Oh, man. But make sure your kids have good grades. Every carrier seems to offer some sort of a discount for a good student. A good student has a 3.0 GPA or better. So make sure they get good grades. And then some carriers also offer discounts for a teen doing like a safe driving program, not like driver's ed, like the carrier's own third party thing where you put your kid in front of a computer for like six or seven hours. And when they show that completion, this discount sticks on your policy and then it saves several hundred dollars. So good grades, any discount program that you can find, torture your kids, sit them in front of a computer for six or seven hours. And if they won't, then make them pay you what that discount would have cost. The other thing is put them in a safe car, something that's got good crash ratings. Obviously you wanna keep them safe, but also something that is going to maybe not get damaged as much. Older cars are actually, like if you can find an older car that's safer, Newer cars cost more to fix. They crash less, but when they break, there's computers everywhere. Yes, a bumper yeah. has all sorts of sensors now that used to just be a piece of steel. But it's tough. Call your insurance agent, price out a couple different cars, but keep your kids' grades up is really the best thing you can do. And don't let them text and drive. If you've ever parked out where we live, Bogey Lake Road, when school is in session, just watch these kids driving into Wald Lake Northern High School. It is the Indy 500. So don't drive there. Don't drive near schools and keep your own insurance rates down. But just try to raise responsible kids and hope that they are safe drivers and get good grades. But that's what we all want for everything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So in our situation, or most of the families that I work with have at least two kids, I'd say probably half of the families I work with have three or more kids. I'm still the outlier because I do have a few families I work with that do have triplets, obviously. But Say when the triplets turn 16 and they're ready to get their licenses, it doesn't matter if we have, say we have three cars. So Teresa's driving one, I'm driving one, and then we have one for the kids. It doesn't really matter that we just have one car for them. I should expect an astronomical number. I mean, there is a ratio, and I don't know what it is, but we just see it happen. When the number of cars equals the number of drivers, the price is higher than if the number of 
cars and drivers is different. And the only way I can explain it, because I am not that smart when it comes to numbers, is if you have three cars and three drivers, statistically, each car will be driven 100% and each person will drive 100%. When that ratio is different, let's say you have three cars and four drivers, now each driver can't possibly drive 100% of the time because there's just not enough cars to do that. So that cost goes down. If you have six drivers and three cars, again, each driver can't possibly be driving each car all the time. When you have more cars than drivers, that's considered a risk because number one, insurance carriers question, well, who's hidden? Who am I not knowing about? Is there a brother, a teen driver, somebody hasn't told me about, a relative, something like that driving the car? But then each car can't be driven 100% of the time because there's not as many drivers as cars. So that ratio of cars to drivers, I don't know what the secret number is, but that does matter. So having that number not be equal definitely helps. Okay. That would be good feedback for my families that have younger drivers. If you can have, say you have two teenage drivers. Have the kids share a car. Have a shared car. Okay. One thing that you touched on, I want to go back to is you see these advertised now with the insurance companies where they have these programs where if you let them track you for so long, you can get a discount. I guess, how do you feel about those? Are they worth it? Because I guess on some hand, if you're a decent driver or a good driver, you could see a discount. But if you're technically a bad driver and don't realize it, they're going to have all this information on you. And I'm sure they can use it against you to increase your rate. As a general rule, our agency does not sell those things. We don't offer them. I worked for a company once who did offer them. And the amount of questions we got about this thing. How do I plug it in? Where does it go? We'd have to reach out. It's not reporting. Like we spent so much time on this little device. It wasn't worth it. Then it's tracking where you're going, whether you believe that it is or not. And there's people that certainly don't like that. But I'll tell you the main reason I don't want one. I tested one out. One of our carriers gave me one. They're like, hey, plug this into your car and see how it works. Oh my God. My kids were beeping at me in the background because when you do a hard break, it beeps at you every light it's beeping at me. And then my kids started beeping at me and I was like, okay, we are done. (laughs) So it ended up giving me like an 8% discount, which is nice. It's not on my current policy. It was with a carrier I don't actually use, but it was a pest. And so it's nice. And I don't think it's being used against me, but the problem is, and the main reason we don't sell them, it's not the customer service. It's not the annoyance. It's a lot of these carriers. If you plug it in, you get, let's say a 10% discount. Well, if you're a bad driver, that discount can go down. It could go up if you're a good driver, but it could go down. I don't want to be the one taking that phone call when they say, why'd my payment go up? I never want to have some, why'd my payment go up? That's just not fun. And it goes up within like 90 days. It's not like I can say it renewed, your price went up. It's you aren't a good driver, your price went up. Well, then people are going to look for new insurance. So it's just not a benefit, I think, enough to the customer or a benefit enough to the agency, it was more work than it was worth. So I don't like them. I understand why the carriers use them. The data is so important to them for future pricing and marketing and whatever. I don't think there's any bad stuff going on. Like I don't think they care where you go, but they care when you go and they care how fast you get there. I just prefer to not have people deal with those things and not every carrier offers them. Okay. So I want to come back to talk about Levin Insurance and how your agency is set up because I would consider us independent. I'm an independent registered investment advisor registered here in the state of Michigan by practice nationwide. Levin Insurance Agency is an independent insurance agency. Can you go into a little bit of detail about what that means and how that could be beneficial to clients that come to you for home or auto or whatever their insurance needs are? Absolutely. So there's two different ways to skin the personal insurance cat, if you will. There are captive or exclusive agents, that's your all states, your state farms, your farmers, and those agents can only sell in general that company. So you call them and they are trying to fit their product to you. When you call me, I might not offer those independent carriers. I can't offer a state farm or a farmer's but the carriers I do offer, offer more choices so I can fit the customer and their needs to the right carrier. Not every customer is the best fit for carrier A. So maybe we look at carrier B 
or carrier A has a price that's not great. Now I look at carrier B and say, hey, that's a good price and that's good coverage. So it gives people more options, more flexibility, and it allows me to build a longer term relationship with customers. Let's say you're with me a couple of years, we notice your price goes up, it's more than what's comfortable anymore. So now I can look for new insurance within my agencies. You don't need to go to another agent, establish a new relationship, learn new routines, figure out how to reach them, who you like in the office, whatever. You're still with my agency. We just have a different carrier insuring you. And I've got all your notes. I know that your dog's name is Fluffy and that your kids play softball. And, and that kind of stuff becomes important over time. That's the main difference. I have access to more carriers. I don't have access to every carrier, but I have access to more carriers to give people more options and find the right fit. We had this conversation, I think a couple of years ago, it was eye-opening to me in working with somebody independent like yourself. We had a claim, we had a, a water issue at our house. And, you know, in talking to you, I immediately called my insurance carrier. And then I called you and you're like, why did you do that? You should have called me first because I would have told you based on what you told me happened not to call the carrier. Even though we filed a claim, we didn't have any cost on that claim but it still goes down as a claim and it affects our rating. Yeah, we encourage our customers, whether we were on the captive side or the independent side, call us first. We are your agent. Let us help you make decisions about what do I do next? Whether it's, I wanna buy a new car, let me price out a couple different cars for you, or I'm thinking of filing a claim. What happened? Is everybody okay? How much is it gonna cost? Does it even make sense to file a claim? We want our customers to make good decisions with their insurance. One of the most common claims that we tell people not to file is if they lose power and they lose the food in their refrigerator, like, please don't file that claim. That coverage is on your policy and it's meant to be used in conjunction with there was a tornado and it knocked down my house and I lost everything in my refrigerator. Not, I lost power for eight hours. Just don't open your fridge. But that's the kind of thing you get $500 of payout and it makes your rates higher for five years. It just doesn't make sense. I made that mistake when I was in my early 20s before I was in insurance. So that one is very near and dear to my heart. So it's calling us for that kind of advice. You want to file a claim, go ahead. We'll never get in your way. But we do want to have that conversation with you and really provide you with that value. I think that's really, really important because I don't think a lot of people are in that mindset. Because I know when people first start working with me, even though I've explained to them, hey, this is beyond numbers. I am going to be really into your life, both on the personal and the financial side. And so when things come up like a job change or some kind of life transition that they think, man, I need to pick up the phone, talk to Paul about this, whether they got a job offer or they're looking at moving companies or whatever it may be, some kind of life transition until they go through at least one of those with me and then they get how I really work and operate. Then they're like, oh, I'm calling Paul because I need to look at refinance my mortgage and he'll know the person to call. Just like when I've referred people to you. And I think building that relationship is paramount. And I don't think people really think about that building a relationship with their insurance provider. And that's why I send people to you. That's why I love working with you because we have that similarity where you go above and beyond because you really care about the families, the clients that you serve, the community that you work in because you want to help them. You and Jeff genuinely want to help people. And I think that's so important in establishing these long-term relationships. Yeah, I agree. And we love working with you. And a lot of times insurance is like the last stop on somebody's financial journey. So we often can't repay the favors when people send us referrals, although we send awesome gift baskets at the holidays. You do. You do. <laughs> my kids um, devoured popcorn. I love helping my friends and family and people local in the community. I know the area. I know people. Like, imagine, would you rather have somebody insuring you who you've never met, who is in some call center in Texas, doesn't know Michigan, doesn't know Michigan's insurance laws, doesn't know Michigan's weather, doesn't know that your home is super fancy on the inside. They just know how many square feet it is. Like, who's going to be the person to better insure you? And if my friends come to me, I'm honored. I never, ever ask my friends about their insurance. I'm here, but it can get awkward. So I, I try to leave it out of the conversation as I know that you do as well. But you're there. And even if it's somebody who's not your customer, 
I know that both of us are always happy to provide advice. I've had lots of people reach out to me about reform. They're not my customers, but I'm happy to give them advice. I think that it's important to always just do the right thing and it will come back and you'll sleep really well at night rather than trying to do it any other way and and not sleeping well at night. So my last insurance question that I want to circle back to is the concept of umbrella insurance. I'm glad that was going to be the last thing I was going to have you bring up. Awesome job, Paul. Because I see this more and more with the families that I work with is that I think most don't, most don't understand. And if I were to propose, hey, I think you should go out and buy this umbrella insurance policy or more insurance, even though like I'm not an insurance agent like you, but when I look at, it's part of what I do with holistic financial planning. I'm looking at their estate, their retirement, their insurance, their taxes, their education planning, the whole gamut. And what I see when I see a person with a lot of assets and a lot of assets, everybody thinks, well, a lot of assets is a million dollars or more, whatever the number is. But really a lot of assets could be a couple hundred thousand, 500,000. And most people that I work with have that sitting in IRAs, 401ks, taxable workers accounts. They have investments all over and those all add up quickly. So I wanted to bring this topic up to you to maybe lay out what umbrella insurance is and why it's so useful and can be so important. The first thing I can say is if people stopped calling it umbrella insurance and started calling it asset insurance, I think it would help people's light bulbs go off because it's protecting your assets. Umbrella is a term because it is literally an umbrella over everything. It goes above and beyond your auto and your home insurance. It protects everything you own, but it's really asset insurance. And it protects you above and beyond the limits of liability on your auto insurance policy and your home insurance policy. You have to have certain minimum limits on your auto and home policy to get an umbrella. And then the coverage can go from a million, two million, five million, ten million. It can go very high. They also offer them for businesses, which is interesting. But it's just an extra layer of coverage and it's so inexpensive. It's like, why wouldn't you do this? It's literally like a dollar a day or less for a million dollars unless you've got teen drivers or DUIs or something like that. So it's super inexpensive and it not only covers what you have, it can cover what you earn. Let's say you've got a decent job and you're going to be making money over time. Let's say you're a doctor fresh out of school. You might be making 30,000 a year, but in a couple of years, you're going to be making 200,000 a year. Well, if you get into an accident with somebody today at 30,000 a year income, but you're a doctor, you better believe they're calling Sam and Sam's going to set something up where they're going to garnish your wages for a while because it's coming. Or let's say you drive a nice car and you're not in a not nice area. You are a target now because somebody figures you've got money. I'm going to try and sue you. I'm going to get in an accident with you and now I'm going to sue you. Having that umbrella policy is like if you rent a car and you buy their insurance and you crash their car, you just toss them the keys and walk away. Like that's kind of what an umbrella insurance policy is like. I'm covered. I'm good. Even if you don't have the assets now, but you might have them one day, you really want to make sure that you're protected. And what we're encouraging a lot of people with auto insurance reform is do whatever you want with the medical, but make sure that your liability is beefed up. That minimum 250000 per person, 500000 per accident, that state default, that should be the minimum that you consider because anybody can sue you. That minimum used to be, what was it, 100, 300? It used to be 20000 per person, 40000 per accident. The minimum is now 50000 per person, 100000 per accident. But then they created this default of 250500 So if you don't choose something, or if you don't sign the paper, like let's say you had 2040, you don't sign the paper to keep the minimum, you're automatically going to go to 25500 Or you were at 100, 300 and you don't sign the paper and return it at renewal, you're going to go to 25500 You have to sign to do anything other than the default. And the default medical is unlimited. What we're suggesting to a lot of people is if you save money with auto reform, consider using that money to buy an umbrella policy. And with the carriers that you work with, Are they able to bundle the auto, home, and asset insurance together? Or Yes, you actually have to. You have to have an underlying auto to get the umbrella. The umbrella comes from the carrier who does the auto. 
We have one carrier that does it attached to the home. We do have some standalone. Let's say you've got auto and home somewhere else. I do have a carrier that does standalone umbrellas. You still have to meet the minimum underlying limits, but those standalones cost more than just doing it with the auto in the home. But if your agent is not offering that to you, find a new agent. Like you need an agent who's protecting you, not just collecting your premiums. Okay. Well, I think we'll now transition into a new topic since we've talked about insurance for quite a bit. One of the things that's interesting about the launch of this podcast and having these conversations with a lot of people is that we go beyond just numbers and financial. It's about life, parenting, and of course, got to throw in the word, multiples. I thought the word was going to be COVID. <laughs> I'll get to that in a second. But you and Jeff are in this unique situation where your husband and wife running your own business, and you have a set of twins. Okay, now I'll bring the word in, COVID. COVID has hit. What has it been like for you and Jeff running the business, being at home with the kids, running your family? Talk to us a little bit about that and how it's been, I guess, the pros and the cons, because I think some people have really struggled and some people have done better. I'm grateful that I'm in a business that I could quickly pick up and move home. I think my team is as well. Uh, on March 17th, we moved every single one of our employees home, stayed there until June 1st. And so grateful to be in that business, not only as a business owner, but so then I could be there for my kids who also got moved home that day. Being self-employed allows us that flexibility to always have somebody there for the kids, whether it's me or Jeff. We work a half a mile from the house, so I can always be home quickly. We've got awesome kids, and I think that helps a lot. The business has just been part of our life together. Andrew, my son, loves to do spreadsheets and keeps track of numbers in the business and loves to figure that stuff out, although he's been a little distracted this summer with summer camp. But he loves to do the spreadsheets. They're bought in. The kids like to come into the office and send out our postcards or prepare our folders that we send to people. And, and I think having the kids invested in the business helped us when we had to move home and okay, mom's here, but mom's got to work. It helped them understand like, okay, mom's got to work. Like it's just always been how it's been. And whether they're the same age or different ages, I think keeping the kids involved in that family business, I think has been important. Having awesome kids certainly helps, but that flexibility to do what I need when I need to do things and do the things I need to do has just been, been priceless, especially now. I'd never been able to wrap my mind around how families with two full-time working parents make it work. As long as we've had kids, one of us has always been self-employed. Now both of us are, but one of us always has been. So we've never had to figure out what time do I leave work? How do I make my boss understand that I got to go pick the kids up from daycare or whatever? Like we've never had to figure that out. I do not know how people do it. And I still don't know. And I certainly know even less now that kids are going to be home and mom and dad also have to work full time and kids actually have to learn. I don't know, but having one kid, two kids, 10 kids, I think being a strong family unit is what's getting us through it. And having the kids understand the business and knowing when to leave mom and dad alone and, and when they can come in is, is an important skill that they've developed. I think what you just hit on that last point, it's been more of a roller coaster ride where you can really feel the ups and you can really feel the downs. With us, last summer, we put our kids through the school program called Primetime for people that may not know what that is, but basically the school offers a program throughout the summer that the kids can go to eight to six or seven to six, whatever. They're with their friends, they're doing activities. And now we didn't have that this summer. And now we went from March to June with homeschooling. And now we're full time at home throughout the summer. Luckily, we have some help. But I agree with you. I really empathize with parents that both work, that are trying to figure this out still. And especially those that don't have the means to be able to maybe hire outside help. And that's been a real heartbreaker for me. And I think as we move into school in a few weeks here in Metro Detroit, and parents are faced with this situation where they don't know what they're going to do, and they don't have the means to be able to bring somebody else in, this whole pod concept that we've talked about earlier and having somebody come in and help families, there's still families that won't be able to afford that. And I think that this whole situation, COVID, is going to create a further divide between the haves and the have-nots. 
And personally, I'm looking for ways to be able to help within the community. Talking to one of my families yesterday, they see the same thing. He's a business owner and he's taking people in as like trying to get people. He owns a body shop collision. And so he's taking people in as an apprentice. He can see the struggles firsthand. So I don't know what the answers are. It's been a challenge. All the school districts, you know, I've faced this challenge. I think some have handled it better than others, trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. But when school fires up here officially in two more weeks, there's still going to be a lot of families wondering, what are we going to do? Yeah, it's really unfortunate. And I wish I had answers. I'm a problem solver. And the answers I have are not necessarily answers people want or possible, but I think they could be. But it's tough. How do you help the people who can't work at home? Let's say you could afford to have somebody come in. Don't, don't you want to spend time with your kids? Or now you're a frontline type of worker and coming home is perhaps unsafe or chaotic or I don't know. There's so much I don't know. I don't know how this is all going to work. There might be school, but kids need help. They need teachers. They need people. They need their friends. And it's a challenge. It's tough. I'm grateful that Jeff and I have something that gives us the opportunity to not have to worry. I don't have worries that my kids won't have care. I don't have worries that my kids won't have help or that they won't have support. But there are so many people that are up at night worrying, and that is heartbreaking. So I'm going to line you up for my closing question. I'm going to twist it a little bit. One of my peers in the industry, he has this podcast, and he has this closing question for everybody, which is the kindest thing that anybody's ever done for you. In a few episodes, sorry, Patrick, I stole your question. And so I've been trying to work on a new one. And since a lot of this podcast is family-based, I thought I'd try this one with you, Shana. What is the one thing that you love the most about your family? Oh, wow. My family. I love that my family is there no matter what, whether it's my extended family and you know we've all been through tough times, whether it's sicknesses or death or financial issues or whatever, the political craziness, everybody's still family at the end. And that always comes first. My immediate family, we're all very patient with each other. We're together more now than we ever have been. And I think that we like being around each other and that's helping us get through everything, but we're being patient with each other. And I think that when you like the people you're with, whether it's at work or at home or socially, it makes life a lot more fun. And I like that my family puts family first. All right. Well, I think that's an excellent ending to close out our conversation. Shana, I cannot thank you enough. In the show notes, I'll put some links out to Levin Insurance and how to reach Shana. Like I said, I love working with you, Shana, and the fact that you take such great care of your clients and families and provide a lot of value. So thank you so much for being on the show today and look forward to continuing this conversation offline. All right, Paul. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Emotional Balance Sheet Podcast. Please visit TamaCapital.com to subscribe to this podcast or to connect with certified financial planner and registered investment advisor, Paul Fenner of Tama Capital. And please join us again next time on the Emotional Balance Sheet Podcast. Mm-hmm.